Chapter 18 The twelve years, continued Mrs. Dean, following that dismal period were the happiest of my life. My greatest troubles in their passage rose from our little lady's trifling illnesses, which she had to experience in common with all children, rich and poor. For the rest, after six months, she grew like a larch, and could walk and talk too in her own way, before the heath blossomed a second time over Mrs. Linton's dust. She was the most winning thing that ever brought sunshine into a desolate house, a real beauty in face, with the Earnshaw's handsome dark eyes, but the Linton's fair skin and small features, and yellow curling hair. Her spirit was high, though not rough, and qualified by a heart sensitive and lively to excess in its affections. That capacity for intense attachments reminded me of her mother. Still, she did not resemble her, for she could be soft and mild as a dove, and she had a gentle voice and pensive expression. Her anger was never furious, her love never fierce. It was deep and tender. However, it must be acknowledged, she had faults to foil her gifts. A propensity to saucy was one, and a perverse will, that indulged children invariably acquire, whether they be good-tempered or cross. If a servant chanced to vex her, it was always, I shall tell Papa, and if he reproved her, even by a look, you would have thought it a heartbreaking business. I don't believe he ever did speak a harsh word to her. He took her education entirely on himself, and made it an amusement. Fortunately, curiosity and a quick intellect made her an apt scholar. She learned rapidly and eagerly, and did honor to his teachings. Till she reached the age of thirteen, she had not once been beyond the range of the park by herself. Mr. Linton would take her with him a mile or so outside on rare occasions, but he trusted her to no one else. Gimmerton was an unsubstantial name in her ears, the chapel, the only building she had approached or entered except her own home. Withering Heights and Mr. Heathcliff did not exist for her. She was a perfect recluse, and apparently perfectly contented. Sometimes, indeed, while surveying the country from her nursery window, she would observe, Ellen, how long will it be before I can walk to the top of those hills? I wonder what lies on the other side. Is it the sea? No, Miss Cathy, I would answer. It's hills again, just like these. And what are those golden rocks like when you stand under them, she once asked. The abrupt descent of Penistone Crags particularly attracted her notice, especially when the setting sun shone on it and the topmost heights and the whole extent of landscape besides lay in shadow. I explained that they were bare masses of stone, with hardly enough earth in their clefts to nourish a stunted tree. And why are they bright so long after it is evening here, she pursued. Because they are a great deal higher up than we are, replied I. You could not climb them, they are too high and steep. In winter, the frost is always there before it comes to us, and deep into summer I have found snow under that black hollow on the northeast side. Oh, have you been on them? she cried gleefully. Then I can go too, when I am a woman. Has Papa been, Ellen? Papa would tell you, miss, I answered hastily, that they are not worth the trouble of visiting. The moors, where you ramble with him, are much nicer, and Thrushcross Park is the finest place in the world. But I know the park, and I don't know those, she murmured to herself, and I should delight to look round me from the brow of that tallest point. My little pony Minnie shall take me some time. One of the maids mentioning the fairy cave quite turned her head with a desire to fulfill this project. She teased Mr. Linton about it, and he promised she should have the journey when she got older, but Miss Catherine measured her age by months and, now am I old enough to go to Penistone Crags, was the constant question in her mouth. The road thither wound close by withering heights. Edgar had not the heart to pass it, so she received as constantly the answer, not yet, love, not yet. I said Mrs. Heathcliff lived about a dozen years after quitting her husband. Her family were of a delicate constitution. She and Edgar both lacked the ruddy health that you will generally meet in these parts. What her last illness was, I am not certain. I conjecture they died of the same thing, a kind of fever, slow at its commencement, but incurable, and rapidly consuming life towards the close. She wrote to inform her brother of the probable conclusion of a four months indisposition under which she had suffered and entreated him to come to her if possible, for she had much to settle, and she wished to bid him adieu, and deliver Linton safely into his hands. Her hope was that Linton might be left with him, as he had been with her, his father, she would fain convince herself had no desire to assume the burden of his maintenance or education, 
My master hesitated not a moment in complying with her request. Reluctant as he was to leave home at ordinary calls, he flew to answer this commending Catherine to my peculiar vigilance in his absence with reiterated orders that she must not wander out of the park. Even under my escort, he did not calculate on her going unaccompanied. He was away three weeks. First day or two, my charge sat in a corner of the library, too sad for either reading or playing. In that quiet state, she caused me little trouble, but it was succeeded by an interval of impatient, fretful weariness, and being too busy and too old then to run up and down amusing her, I hit on a method by which she might entertain herself. I used to send her on her travels round the grounds, now on foot and now on a pony, indulging her with a patient audience of all her real and imaginary adventures when she returned. The summer shone in full prime, and she took such a taste for this solitary rambling that she often contrived to remain out from breakfast till tea, and then the evenings were spent in recounting her fanciful tales. I did not fear her breaking bounds because the gates were generally locked, and I thought she would scarcely venture forth alone, if they had stood wide open. Unluckily, my confidence proved misplaced. Catherine came to me one morning at eight o'clock, and said she was that day an Arabian merchant going to cross the desert with his caravan, and I must give her plenty of provision for herself and beasts, a horse, and three camels, personated by a large hound and a couple of pointers. I got together good store of dainties, and slung them in a basket on one side of the saddle, and she sprang up as gay as a fairy, sheltered by her wide-brimmed hat and gauze veil from the July sun, and trotted off with a merry laugh, mocking my cautious counsel to avoid galloping and come back early. The naughty thing never made her appearance at tea. One traveler, the hound being an old dog and fond of its ease, returned, but neither Cathy nor the pony nor the two pointers were visible in any direction. I dispatched emissaries down this path and that path, and at last went wandering in search of her myself. There was a laborer working at a fence round the plantation on the borders of the grounds. I inquired of him if he had seen our young lady. I saw her at morn, he replied. She would have me to cut her a hazel switch, and then she leapt her galloway over the hedge yonder, where it is lowest, and galloped out of sight. You may guess how I felt at hearing this news. It struck me directly she must have started for Penistone Crags. What will become of her? I ejaculated pushing through a gap which the man was repairing and making straight to the high road. I walked as if for a wager, mile after mile till a turn brought me in view of the heights, but no Catherine could I detect far or near. The crags lie about a mile and a half beyond Mr. Heathcliff's place, and that is four from the Grange, so I began to fear night would fall ere I could reach them. And what if she should have slipped in the clambering among them, I reflected, and been killed or broken some of her bones? My suspense was truly painful, and at first it gave me delightful relief to observe, in hurrying by the farmhouse, Charlie, the fiercest of the pointers, lying under a window, with swelled head and bleeding ear. I opened the wicket and ran to the door, knocking vehemently for admittance. A woman whom I knew, and who formerly lived at Gimmerton, answered. She had been servant there since the death of Mr. Earnshaw. Ah, said she, you are come a-seeking your little mistress. Don't be frightened. She's here safe, but I'm glad it isn't the master. He is not at home, then, is he? I panted, quite breathless with quick walking and alarm. No, no, she replied. Both he and Joseph are off, and I think they won't return this hour or more. Step in and rest you a bit. I entered and beheld my stray lamb seated on the hearth, rocking herself in a little chair that had been her mother's when a child. Her hat was hung against the wall, and she seemed perfectly at home, laughing and chattering, in the best spirits imaginable, to Hareton, now a great strong lad of eighteen, who stared at her with considerable curiosity and astonishment, comprehending precious little of the fluent succession of remarks and questions which her tongue never ceased pouring out. Very well, miss, I exclaimed, concealing my joy under an angry countenance. This is your last ride till Papa comes back. I'll not trust you over the threshold again, you naughty, naughty girl. Aha, Ellen, she cried gaily, jumping up and running to my side. I shall have a pretty story to tell tonight, and so you found me out. Have you ever been here in your life before? Put that hat on and come home at once, said I. I'm dreadfully grieved at you, Miss Cathy. You've done extremely wrong. It's no use pouting and crying. That won't repay the trouble I've had scouring the country after you. 
to think how Mr. Linton charged me to keep you in, and you stealing off so. It shows you are a cunning little fox, and nobody will put faith in you any more. What have I done, sobbed she, instantly checked. Papa charged me nothing. He'll not scold me, Ellen. He's never cross like you. Come, come, I repeated. I'll tie the ribbon. Now, let us have no petulance. Oh, for shame. You, thirteen years old and such a baby. This exclamation was caused by her pushing the hat from her head and retreating to the chimney out of my reach. Nay, said the servant. Don't be hard on the bonny lass, Mrs. Dean. We've made her stop. She'd fain have ridden forwards, afeard you should be uneasy. Hareton offered to go with her, and I thought he should. It's a wild road over the hills. Hareton, during the discussion, stood with his hands in his pockets, too awkward to speak, though he looked as if he did not relish my intrusion. How long am I to wait? I continued, disregarding the woman's interference. It will be dark in ten minutes. Where is the pony, Miss Cathy? And where is Phoenix? I shall leave you unless you be quick, so please yourself. The pony is in the yard, she replied, and Phoenix is shut in there. He's bitten, and so is Charlie. I was going to tell you all about it, but you are in a bad temper and don't deserve to hear. I picked up her hat and approached to reinstate it, but perceiving that the people of the house took her part, she commenced capering round the room, and on my giving chase, ran like a mouse over and under and behind the furniture, rendering it ridiculous for me to pursue. Hareton and the woman laughed, and she joined them, and waxed more impertinent still, till I cried in great irritation. Well, Miss Cathy, if you are aware whose house this is, you'd be glad enough to get out, said she, turning to Hareton. Nay, he replied, looking down and blushing bashfully. He could not stand a steady gaze from her eyes, though they were just his own. Whose, then, your master, she asked? He colored deeper, with a different feeling, muttered an oath, and turned away. Who is his master, continued the tiresome girl, appealing to me. He talked about our house and our folk. I thought he had been the owner's son, and he never said miss. He should have done, shouldn't he, if he's a servant? Hareton grew black as a thundercloud at this childish speech. I silently shook my questioner and at last succeeded in equipping her for departure. Now get my horse, she said, addressing her unknown kinsman as she would have one of the stable boys at the Grange, and you may come with me. I want to see where the goblin hunter rises in the marsh, and to hear about the farishes, as you call them. But make haste. What's the matter? Get my horse, I say. I'll see thee damned before I be thy servant, growled the lad. You'll see me what? asked Catherine in surprise. Damned, thou saucy witch, he replied. There, Miss Cathy. You see, you have gotten to pretty company, I interposed. Nice words to be used to a young lady. Pray, don't begin to dispute with him. Come, let us seek for many ourselves, and be gone. But Ellen, cried she, staring fixed in astonishment, how dare he speak so to me? Mustn't he be made to do as I ask him? You wicked creature, I shall tell Papa what you said. Now then. Hareton did not appear to feel this threat, so the tears sprang into her eyes with indignation. You bring the pony, she exclaimed, turning to the woman, and let my dog free this moment. Softly, miss, answered the address, you'll lose nothing by being civil. Though Mr. Hareton here, be not the master's son, he's your cousin, and I was never hired to serve you. He, my cousin? cried Cathy with a scornful laugh. Yes, indeed, responded the reprover. Oh, Ellen, don't let them say such things, she pursued in great trouble. Papa is gone to fetch my cousin from London. My cousin is a gentleman's son. That my... She stopped and wept outright upset at the bare notion of relationship with such a clown. Hush, hush, I whispered. People can have many cousins and of all sorts, Miss Cathy, without being any the worst for it. Only they needn't keep their company if they be disagreeable and bad. He's not, he's not my cousin, Ellen, she went on, gathering fresh grief from reflection and flinging herself into my arms for refuge from the idea. I was much vexed at her and the servant for their mutual revelations, having no doubt of Linton's approaching arrival, communicated by the former, being reported to Mr. Heathcliff, and feeling as confident that Catherine's first thought on her father's return would be to seek an explanation of the latter's assertion concerning her rude-bred kindred. Hareton, recovering from his disgust at being taken for a servant, seemed moved by her distress, and, having fetched the pony round the door, he took to propitiate her a fine crooked-legged terrier whelp from the kennel, and putting it into her hand, bit her whist for he meant not. Pausing in her lamentations, she surveyed him with a glance of awe and horror, and then burst forth anew. 
I could scarcely refrain from smiling at this antipathy to the poor fellow, who was well-made, athletic youth, good-looking in features and stout and healthy, but attired in garments befitting his daily occupations of working on the farm and lounging among the moors after rabbits and game. Still, I thought I could detect his physiognomy, a mind owing better qualities than his father's ever possessed. Good things lost amid a wilderness of weeds, to be sure, whose rankness far overtopped their neglected growth, yet notwithstanding, evidence of a wealthy soil that might yield luxuriant crops under other and favorable circumstances. Mr. Heathcliff, I believe, had not treated him physically ill, thanks to his fearless nature, which offered no temptation to that course of oppression. He had none of the timid susceptibility that would have given Zeiss to ill treatment in Heathcliff's judgment. He appeared to have bent his malevolence on making him a brute. He was never taught to read or write, never rebuked for any bad habit which did not annoy his keeper, never led a single step towards virtue, or guarded by a single precept against vice. And from what I heard, Joseph contributed much to his deterioration by a narrow-minded partiality which prompted him to flatter and pet him, as a boy, because he was the head of the old family. And as he had been in the habit of accusing Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff when children, of putting the master past his patience, and compelling him to seek solace in drink by what he termed their awful ways, so at present he laid the whole burden of Hareton's faults on the shoulders of the usurping of his property. Is the lad swore he wouldn't correct him, nor, however culpably, he behaved. It gave Joseph satisfaction, apparently, to watch him go the worst lengths. He allowed that the lad was ruined, that his soul was abandoned to perdition, but then he reflected that Heathcliff must answer for it. Hareton's blood would be required at his hands, and there lay immense consolation in that thought. Joseph had instilled into him a pride of name, and of his lineage. He would, had he dared, have fostered hate between him and the present owner of the Heights but his dread of that owner amounted to superstition, and he confided his feelings regarding him to muttered innuendos and private combinations. I don't pretend to be intimately acquainted with the mode of living customary in those days at Withering Heights. I only speak from hearsay, for I saw little. The villagers affirmed Mr. Heathcliff was near, and a cruel hard landlord to his tenants, but the house inside had regained its ancient aspect of comfort under female management and the scenes of riot common in Hindley's time were not now enacted within its walls. The master was too gloomy to seek companionship with any people, good or bad, and he is yet. This, however, is not making progress with my story. Miss Cathy rejected the peace offering of the terrier and demanded her own dogs, Charlie and Phoenix. They came limping and hanging their heads. We set out for home steady out of sorts, every one of us. I could not ring from my little lady how she had spent the day, except that, as I supposed, the goal of her pilgrimage was Penistone Crags, and she arrived without adventure to the gate of the farmhouse, where Hareton happened to issue forth, attended by some canine followers, who attacked her train. They had a smart battle before their owners could separate them, that formed an introduction. Catherine told Hareton who she was, and where she was going, and asked him to show her the way, finally beguiling him to accompany her. He opened the mysteries of the fairy cave, and twenty other queer places, but being in disgrace, I was not favored with a description of the interesting objects she saw. I could gather, however, that her guide had been a favorite till she hurt his feelings by addressing him as a servant, and Heathcliff's housekeeper hurt hers by calling him her cousin. Then the language he had held to her rankled in her heart. She, who was always love and darling and queen and angel, with everybody at the Grange, to be insulted so shockingly by a stranger, she did not comprehend it, and hard work I had to obtain a promise that she would not lay the grievance before her father. I explained how he objected to the whole household at the Heights, and how sorry he would be to find she had been there, but I insisted most on the fact that if she revealed my negligence of his orders, he would perhaps be so angry that I should have to leave, and Cathy couldn't bear that prospect, so she pledged her word and kept it for my sake. After all, she was a sweet little girl.